In 11 days' time, the new Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, will deliver the budget just a few weeks after his surprise promotion in the Cabinet reshuffle. And while it will be the first budget for Mr Sunak, it will be the last for his Labour opposite number, John McDonnell, who plans to step back from the front bench when a new Labour leader is elected in April. And John McDonnell joins us now. Thank you very much for yeah. being with us. Um, before we get on to the budget, um, I'm just keen to ask you about coronavirus, mm. um, something lots of our viewers will be really concerned about. Um, we've seen the government's battle plan, the worst-case scenario battle plan, uh, out this morning. Do you think they're doing enough? I think we've got to follow the chief medical officer's advice. I think that the, the clinicians are doing a good job as best they can. Um, there needs to be, I think, more direction from the Prime Minister in particular. I was worried about the delay, for example, in setting up the COBRA meetings. There needs to be political leadership of this more direct. Um, remember, this is against the backdrop as well, is we've lost 17,000 hospital beds in the NHS as a result of austerity cuts. That's a worry. So do you think the NHS is prepared I think for a pandemic? I think, I think they're really doing their best. But in the light of the cuts that have gone on, we saw last week the figures... The critical beds which we needed for many of these cases, 80% capacity full already. So we're suffering from, well, we're suffering from 10 years of austerity. But I'm sure that the clinicians, the NHS staff will rise to the challenge. They always do, but we're putting them under a lot of pressure because we've taken such capacity out of the NHS because of the cuts. So you're concerned about how prepared the health service would be? I'm concerned that they'll, because of a 10 years of austerity, the capacity within NHS has been cut quite dramatically. So it will put a lot of pressure on our staff and clinicians, but they'll always rise to the challenge. Their commitment is beyond anything asked of them, always, and they'll do it. Chief Medical Officer, I think, has given the right advice. We've got to follow it. Politicians need to be on the ball and following what advice we're given. OK, well, we'll be talking to the House Secretary, uh, Matt Hancock, later on the programme, um, so we'll be putting some of those sure. views to him as well. Another big story this weekend is the resignation of the most senior official in the Home Office, yeah, uh, yeah. who says he's going to be <clears throat> suing the government for constructive dismissal after what he calls a, a vicious and orchestrated campaign against him uh, by the Home Secretary. Do you think Priti Patel can stay on? I can't see it. Um, it's bizarre. I, look, I was a civil servant before I became a politician. I was the chief exec of the local government association, actually appointed by Conservative and uh, Labour councillors. So I've worked to all parties. And when you get a civil servant going public like this, it's un unprecedented. I can't, I can't remember a case like this. So there must be something pretty bad that, that's gone on. Interesting, this morning, from what I hear, Number 10 has only said that the Prime Minister has confidence in his Cabinet, not specifically Priti Patel. So it looks as though she's on the way out. And that, I think it says something more than about her. I think it says something about this government itself. Within a couple of months, he's lost his Chancellor, and now it looks as though he's going to lose his Home Secretary as well. I think that says something about Boris Johnson's own abilities and management of his own government. I mean, of course, without knowing the details of the specifics, what Sounds went pretty on behind grim, closed doors, well, the government would probably argue that you know, they are prepared to ruffle a few feathers, they're prepared to take on vested interests but and the establishment I, and shake up look, the civil I, service if necessary. I don't mind, I don't mind a shake-up, I don't mind ruffling a few feathers, but you don't go into abuse. That's what the allegation is here swearing and shouting and abusing people and bullying people. You don't go into that. So there's something seriously wrong here. One of the ways the, the Prime Minister could go forward is have an independent investigation. And, but during that period, you'd have to suspend the Home Secretary whilst that went on. But I, it looks as though they're withdrawing support for her by the sound of the statements this morning. If that is the case, it needs to be done quickly and we need to move on because we're facing... Well, coronavirus is one of the issues, but we're also facing a crisis in our prisons, our justice system, our crime on our streets as well. We need a home, we need an effective Home Secretary and an effective Home Office. OK, let's talk about the budget, shall we? Um, it's 11 days, days away, your last as uh, Shadow Chancellor. Um, the government have been pretty <clears throat> clear that they want to turn the spending taps on. Is this going to be the end of austerity? You must be welcoming it. No, I looked at the Institute for Fiscal Studies report last week, made it very, very clear that to uh, reverse austerity, they need to spend, well, the IFS said about £54 billion. The government is promising nothing like that. They're talking about big figures on infrastructure, which is largely supportable because that's Labour policy, but the figures aren't good enough. There's a gap in infrastructure, a hole that they've created over the last 10 years of austerity, about £200 billion. The most I've heard on infrastructure is £100 billion over five years. That just won't make it. 
We've got two emergencies. One is a climate emergency, an existential threat we've got to rise to the challenge of. We've also got a social emergency where virtually all of our public services, as a result of austerity, have gone into crisis. That doesn't look as though they're going to use the scale of investment that's needed to tackle those problems. At the same time, the government, as you say, are promising more investment. It's, they're doing what you've pittance. called for. They've, no, called, it's a they're, they've called for... You've called for the end of austerity, you've called for borrowing to greatest, invest. That is what the government is doing. Some, so perhaps you should just step back and say, greatest this respect. is the right thing to do. Greatest respect. If they were doing the right thing, of course I would. This isn't party political. We're talking about the long-term future of our country. Two emergencies. Existential threat of climate change and social emergency, a crisis in all our public services. To resolve those crises, you've got to invest at scale. They're not talking anywhere near the amounts that are required, and they're not tackling, for example, how you pay for those services, in particular, a fair taxation system and tackling tax evasion and avoidance. So it doesn't look as though they've got a plan that really meets the challenges we face. Uh, reports today that the government's planning to scrap uh, entrepreneurs' tax relief. I mean, that would save £3 billion. Would you, would you welcome it? We said we would scrap the relief but turn it into a grant because then you would then get the productivity gains that everyone needs. It feels a bit, again, like you won't give credit where it's due. If you're saying that you but wouldn't not, support scrapping the relief, I why don't you welcome it? I can't give them credit when all they're offering us is sops and excuses. Take that one example. We don't want entrepreneurs not to have the resources that they need. So instead of giving them a tax credit, which is badly directed, you turn that into a grant where you can direct the investment. What they're doing is sort of half measures and publicity stunts. That isn't going to that isn't going to cope with the crisis we face. Um, pretty extraordinary background uh, to the, the budget, of course, uh, with uh, Sajid Javid resigning, publishing his own uh, budget uh, yesterday uh, in the Times. Um, do you feel any sympathy for the new Chancellor? He's only got 11 days now to get everything together. Look, I, Sava Javid said this, which I thought was right. No self-respecting minister would allow himself to be treated in this way. Have his staff sacked, moved off the site at gunpoint, and then his staff appointed by a policy advisor in number 10. If I was Rishi Sunak, I wouldn't have taken the job. I wouldn't have taken it on those terms. You then become... Well, you become the deputy to Dominic Cummings. That's not good enough. You're dominated by number 10. You need... Well, he's got an opportunity, hasn't he, to push through his budget. You could say he's on It's Dominic now. Cummings' budget. That's what's going to happen. He's now going to follow the orders of a policy advisor in number 10. No self-respecting chance would allow it. You need a strong Treasury to make sure a government stays on course and makes wise decisions. OK, now I'm keen to move on to the Labour leadership. Yeah. You, of course, are backing Rebecca uh, Long-Bailey. I just want to show you a poll for Sky News. Yeah this uh, week, which shows that Keir Starmer's set to win in the first round, if this is right. She's just down there on 31%. What's gone wrong? I don't think it's a matter of going wrong. Members are making a decision. We'll see what comes out in the final vote. Um, Keir got the most of the nominations. That's usually a reflection of the support. But we'll see. There's a few weeks to go yet, and we'll see. But to be honest, nothing's gone wrong. The good thing about... It sounds this... like you're resigned to Keir Starmer winning. Oh, no. I... I... Any one of those candidates would make a good leader of the Labour Party. That's what's great about this. This is the new generation... You're not saying they could all win, though. Oh, no, I think they could. I actually think they could. I think that's one of the best teams you'll see in our politics for a long period of time in terms of going into government. And I think all three of them, they've made it clear, they will appoint one another into the shadow cabinet. You'll find a really strong team... And I think that will take us into government. I think so that's what you're hoping now, that, she, that Rebecca Long-Bailey will get a decent shadow cabinet role. Well, I'm hoping... She, I still hope she'll win. I think there's a good chance she will. We've got a long way to go in the election campaign. It's becoming a bit interminable, I have to say. It's going on for quite a bit. <laughs> but, but all of them, I think, could make good leaders. I think if you're Rebecca saying that, think about what the rest of us are like. <laughs> um, I just want to show you something from a debate that I hosted on Thursday with the three yeah. uh, candidates. And just have a quick listen to this uh, exchange. I was saying over and again, once that Equality and Human Rights Commission is looking at us, don't close the books, give them access to all of our Did records. Rebecca Lombelli speak out at Shadow Cabinet? Look, uh, uh, Rebecca um, didn't speak out in the same way as I did in my view... That's Keir oh, Starmer there though? saying that Rebecca Lombelli, oh, in did. his view, did not speak no, out no, no. on anti semitism He said, no, get Keir right, what he said in the same way he did. Yeah. She did. She did. I was there. They all... Keir did. So did Becky. They both did. So why is he looking so uncomfortable saying that, in his view, she did not speak out in the same way that he did? I don't know. I don't know, because actually they both did. They have different styles. Of course they do. But they both did. And they both expressed... Well, so he's you... wrong, then? No, no. 
I think they both in their own styles did so. He said in the way he did. Well, she spoke in a different way, of course, that's her own style. But they, both echo way, well, they both echoed what I said from quite a long time ago, which is that we weren't fast enough in dealing with this issue and we weren't ruthless enough. Both of them echoed that sentiment. OK. Um, are you worried that if Keir Starmer wins, which he looks like he is on course to do, uh, and Angela Rayner, uh, the front-runner in the deputy leadership, uh, does, <coughs> that the Labour Party is going to move away from the corbyn Macdonald project? No. Uh, Keir issued a policy programme um, two weeks ago, which was the reflection of the existing manifesto, which was fine. All of the candidates... There's been some individual criticism of individual policies, fair enough, but you can't... You can't agree on everything, but all of them, all three of them, have actually endorsed the overall political analysis that we had around. Would you describe them as a Corbynite then? Well, <laughs> I, well, Keir has said he doesn't get designated by an individual name, and Becky and Lisa have said the same thing. I think we get away from personalities. It's the Tony Benn thing. I'm into policies, not personalities. Okay. Now, now you and just finally, you and Jamie Corbyn spent many years on as backbench mm. MPs. You then became Shadow Chancellor, he became the leader of yeah. the opposition. You had cracks at winning an election two times, yeah. and you didn't. You yeah. failed. Came pretty close in 17, then Brexit overtook us, and it was like a tsunami hitting us politically. And it was, I've said before, we were in a vice. One, if we went one way, we'd lose votes. If we went the other way, we'd do lose votes. Do you have any regrets, though? Oh, yeah, of course I do. What, what were your regrets? I think, um, I think sometimes about sorting out the narrative. From 17, it was, up until 17, it was easy. End austerity. After that, we never really had a clear narrative. And I should have been firmer about that. And I've taken the blame for it. I've said two days after the election, if anyone's to blame, blame me. Take it on the chin and move on. And that allows the new leadership to come in then and have, well, I think their own approach, but based upon the political analysis and largely the programme that we've developed okay. as well. We're a united party. And that's the way in which we'll win the next election. OK. John McDonnell, thank you very much for being on the programme.